In grade 8, I was in an Afrikaans medium high school. I had Viskunde, Adrikskunde, Geschiedenis, Afrikaans, Engels, Rekeningkunde, Lebensorientering, and Visual Studies. Even though everyone there spoke Afrikaans, it was the only option of the language at the high school. Every now and then, a white person would speak to me in English, as if I wasn't wearing the exact same uniform as them. The high school I went to was in a predominantly white neighborhood. The reason why it wasn't an entirely white neighborhood was because the people who lived there had black, black domestic workers who lived in their back rooms and because of black people like me, who came there to access one or another resource before going back to our respective townships. I would wake up every single day at half past four, take a bath, prepare my lunch and eat a quick breakfast. My taxi would fetch me at half past five. When I entered the taxi, it was already full. I was the second last person who the driver fetched. If the traffic behaved normally, we would arrive at school at half past six. If something out of the ordinary happened, we would arrive at eight o'clock. School started at half past seven every single day. The taxi would fetch me and a friend of mine who lived near my neighborhood, the other person who was in the same taxi with me, at around three o'clock after school. We always waited together. We waited in front of somebody's yard. The people had a dog, but it seldom disturbed us because their gate was almost always closed when we got out of school. They couldn't really chase us away because we never disturbed anyone and because the government owns the walkways. <laughs> when we when waiting for our taxi, I would always sit down and my friend would always stand up, talking to me. We had a lot of fun together. One day, she was talking to a boy she liked. She was talking to him on the other side of the road. I sat, as always, in front of the house and waited for the taxi to come. I was typing on my tablet, reading a Wattpad book, probably either about a werewolf or some sort of a bad boy, when a guy stopped in front of me. He was a barefoot white man. He was wearing beige shorts and a washed-out orange t-shirt. He had a box with two burgers inside of it in his hand. Hello, he said. I looked at him, confused and vaguely afraid. What does this man want from me? I remember asking myself. But instead, I just said, hello. I just want to tell you that God loves you, he said. I knew God loved me, so I said, yes. Take this, he said, basically shoving the box into my hands. No, thank you. I'm not hungry, I said, chuckling in discomfort. I really wanted him to leave me alone. I so desperately wanted him to leave me alone. I tried to hand the box back to him. No, 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 I insist. I know you're hungry, he said, pushing it back into my hands. I just smiled to him and said, okay. I didn't say thank you. I didn't want his food. I was angry, but I knew that food was waiting for me at home. I just wanted him to leave me alone, so I accepted his unwanted gift. Very begrudging, begrudgingly, mind you. I never looked at his face that day, so I have no idea if he was smiling when he said that, although he probably was. The smile was probably full of self-righteous pride. Pride knowing that he, a heroic white man, a vessel of Christ, spreading his selfless love and care, had given a poor, hungry African girl some food. But I never looked at his face that day, so I can never really know. Although some of the elements of the day are a bit fuzzy, I can bet he probably never looked at my face either. Maybe he would have seen my discomfort. Maybe he would have seen my alarm. Maybe he would have realized that I did not need or want what he tried to give me. But maybe he did look at my face. Maybe he did see all those things. Maybe he saw all of the feelings on my face but simply did not care. Because in my place, all he could see was the image of a poor, hungry African girl. I remember after he left, all I could ask myself was, do I look poor? Do I look hungry? Do I look, look like I need help from strangers? I knew that the answer to all of these questions were no. I knew I didn't look poor, whatever that means, because even though I have never had an iPhone or other flashy markers of wealth, I wore shiny school shoes from Woolworths, my hair was freshly braided, and I had a brand new Samsung tablet. <laughs> I knew I didn't look hungry because I was chubby. I still am. But I didn't know how to answer that last question. Do I look like I need help from strangers, even though I really don't? Hello everyone and welcome to Screw You, the podcast where we bite the hand that feeds us because it keeps feeding us poison. Come on Joshua, you know that cyanides make my stomach hurt. Get me some hydrochloric acid next time. Today we are talking about charities, Africa's number one uh, cause of poison ingestion <laughs> because this episode is particularly spicy i think i should preface it by saying that there is nothing inherently bad with aid or giving aid and all of that stuff more times than not being a part of one or another charity has a greater net positive than a net negative right this is not some moral argument directed at individuals who want to do something min- meaningful in their particular community this episode is basically an essay that seeks to unearth the neo-colonial, imperialist, pro-Western, racist, 
neoliberal and so on and so forth origins of charity as they currently exist. My goal is to illustrate the fact that the NGO industrial complex is very bad actually, not necessarily the everyday people who are members of them. In this first section, we're going to be talking about the origins of charities. And to do that, we have to start with definitions as always. So the Oxford Language Dictionary defines charity as an organization set up to provide help and raise money for those in need or the voluntary giving of help, typically in the form of money to those in need. The same dictionary goes on to define need, the noun, as amongst other things, the state of requiring help or of lacking basic necessities such as food. The word need has Germanic origins, which were then transferred to the Old English language. So it has, in the Old English language, it was called Neodian, Neod and Ned. In Dutch as Nuet and in German as Not, which means danger now. Because Afrikaans is derived from Dutch, I know that Nuet means emergency in Afrikaans. So Nuet Eitrang means emergency exit. Exit, exit, but it also in a more roundabout way means need. But the word in Afrikaans is benwerda. So, according to Britannica, in the Christian Bible, charity is conceptualized as the highest form of love, signifying the reciprocal love between God and man that is made manifest in unselfish love on one's, of, of one's fellow man. St. Paul's classical description of charity is found in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And then finally, we have the definition of philanthropy. I, like many other people, have Instagram. <laughs> so the first time I came across the word philanthropy was in a celebrity's bio, right next to God first, actress, activist, and brand ambassador for X company that either tests on animals or uses the labor of children in the global south to make its products. Philanthropy is defined as the desire to promote the welfare of others, expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. So a very important distinguishing factor between a charity and a philanthropy, the way I understand it, is that a philanthropy is something that is almost exclusively belonging to the hands of individual super rich people. So your run-of-the-mill billionaires, your celebrities, who don't necessarily have a charity, but who are giving aid out of their own wealth just as tax write off <laughs> and the charity now is an organization which aims to fulfill certain functions and requires the assistance of other people to fulfill these functions sometimes they don't need like monetary help from people sometimes it's just like labor sometimes it's just um the funding of a billionaire into the charity again it's a tax write off but um the distinguishing fact is just like who is behind the giving philanthropy is an individual charity is an organization so I want to give you guys a brief history of charity. So charity is as whole as humankind itself, right? The act of giving to each other for nothing other than shared humanness is something innate to people and other animals as well, of course. However, charity as it currently exists and has existed since the 14th century lacks that element of humanness. You see, Winston Churchill put it best when he said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Coincidentally enough, he made a living by raising villages during his time as a junior lieutenant and enabling Hitler Collective to acquire important ground in World War II, whilst committing a bunch of other war crimes and made his life by creating concentration camps in British Kenya, manufacturing famines in Bengal, and dishing out white supremacist, Islamophobic, and anti-anything other than judicial Christianity rhetoric. Our first known records of philanthropy as we currently know it dates back to the Sang Dynasty in China, which spanned from the year 1960 to 1278, which provided poor relief, soup kitchens, orphanages, and burial plots to the Chinese populace. During the Ming Dynasty, which spanned from 1368 to 1644, individual philanthropists often gave in secrets because they didn't want their generosity to be misinterpreted as being politically motivated. By the late Ming period, the public perception of giving evolved and local philanthropists began to openly finance public projects. In 1601, following the fall of the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation and the subsequent breakdown of the traditional philanthropic structure, the British Parliament passed the Statute of Charitable Uses, which shifted responsibility to local trustees to care for those living in their parish. This poor relief model encouraged private responsibility with public oversight, increasing the government's role in meeting um, changing economic and social needs. During the First Great Awakening, which was an evangelical, evangelical movement that promoted a dramatic surge in religious devotion, which spread throughout Protestant you know, Europe and the American colonies, fiery preachers inspired their followers to give alms. 
This fact a rise in charitable acts and a considerable increase in the number of voluntary associations. Okay, I know that there's a lot of years that I'm listing, but I'm saying them because they're relevant, right? There's still a few to get through. Um, next in... 1792, Great Britain found, founded the Free Town in Sierra Leone, a colony designed to provide refuge for slaves. It was located in West Africa. Whilst it was supposedly philanthropic, philanthropic in its aims, the colony allowed Britain to gain a significant foothold in West Africa. This was emblematic of increasing imperialist conquest. The British presence began to upset the kin networks that were central to traditional recipro- reciprocity and instead imposed a rigid European social hierarchy. In 1816, the American Bible Society was created, and just over 10 years later, the Second Great Awakening of 1838 reignited religious fervor in the early 19th century and fueled immense growth of private philanthropy in the form of private voluntary associations that target specific causes, applying religious principles to social reform. In 1834, the British Parliament passed the Poor Law Amendment Act, revising the 1815 Poor Law Act that required each parish to care for and financially support its own poor. The 1834 Act responded to criticism that almsgiving created independence, replacing monetary handouts with a system of workhouses that provided clothing and food in exchange for manual labour. The Landmark Act, which fundamentally shifted the emphasis on philanthropy from almsgiving almsgiving to reform, did so at the expense of the poor, who were forced to live and labor in deplorable conditions at the workhouses. In 1878, evangelical minister um, William Booth renamed his Christian mission and dedicated dedicated to converting um, and his destitute to Christianity to the Salvation Army. Booth organization began to grow and it began to expand across different cities within Great Britain and in other continents, which enabled volunteers to do good and they were motivated by the thought of internal salvation. Today, the Alan Salvation Army continues its global mission with active chapters in over 120 countries. Um, in 1889, in an, in an article published in the North American Review, still magnate Andrew Carnage um, contends that millionaires should be ashamed to die rich and should instead use their wealth to organize the benefic, benefic, benefactions, <laughs> benefactions from which the masses will derive lasting advantage. This concept, known as the gospel of wealth, prompted Carnage and his peers to create living trusts or foundations to distribute their wealth for the public good during and after their lives, which set the standard for modern American philanthropy. In 1918, the oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller Sr. formed the Rockefeller Foundation to promote the well-being of mankind throughout the world. Uh, The foundation has since pioneered efforts such as the Great Revolution, the Green Revolution, which combated the global hunger crisis by increasing agricultural yields. Rockefeller and Carnage thus set the standard for the American Philanthropic Foundation, implementing a business like approach that makes investments which are calculated to yield high returns. The last date, woohoo, for now. In 1984, when a famine overwhelmed Ethiopia, threatening at least 10 million people with starvation, Western governments hesitated to provide aid and they cited the Cold War as political concerns. The heartbreaking imagery of famine victims, however, sparked a tremendous global humanitarian effort and non-governmental organizations raised millions of dollars. The 1985 Live Aid concert prompted viewers worldwide to make contributions. These efforts marked the emergence of a global model of philanthropy that transcends borders and enables giving on unprecedented scale, as well as the emergence of a trend of leveraging the media and popular celebrities to promote giving. After that very long-winded recounting of history, in my script I wrote here, brief recounting of the history of charity, but it's not brief, it's not. But two things should come to the fore after what you just heard. Firstly, there are strong religious undertones that push forward charity and charitable giving. Secondly, while it was originally something to be wary of, being publicly recognized for charitable giving has gradually become a very sought-after aspect of giving. At present, the element of public recognition seems more important than giving itself. In addition, whilst the giver's giving is highly publicized, what they get in return, such as tax write-offs, the ability to control what happens in the political realm, and so on and so forth, remains hidden. So what are the implications of this? How does this impact everyday people's lives, the way our state operates, and other important things to consider? That is what we will be thinking of today. Answering today. 
about that. We can also think about it, obviously, but that is what we'll be seeking to answer today or argue about today. Yes. <laughs> During the apartheid era, the charity legislative framework suffered from, quote, major deficiencies which included mandatory registration in order to fundraise and tax benefits which were very limited and which very few NGOs qualified for, and the failure to recognize the legal existence of associations whose objectives were declared unlawful by the state. This state of affairs changed when apartheid ended and the ANC took the reins. In South Africa, we have four tiers of charity legislative framework. So this is not necessarily, we shouldn't conflate this with like four tiers of charities itself. It's just in the legal framework itself, the legal menu. So if you want to think of it like that, maybe it's like basically themes within a menu. So you have here your uh, beggar, you have your dessert, you have your drinks. Of salads so think of it like that technically in a way <laughs> so the very first tier allows for the establishment under statutory and common law of three forms of npos that is voluntary associations established under common law non-profit trusts established under established under common law and the trust property control act and non-profit com- companies incorporated for a public benefit objective or objective relating to one or more cultural or social activities or communal or group act interests established under section 21 of the companies act um i'll be referring to these as section 21 companies because that was a mouthful obviously (laughs) so in short this tier is the establishment tier it is a more general characteristics character characteristic from what i can tell by that i mean every single south african npo falls into this tier under one of the three categories and then we go up in the tier system more npos just fall away or fall in line the second tier allows the three forms of organizations to apply for a registered non-profit organization status. This is an important breakaway from the apartheid framework where all NPOs had to register. Presently, registration is wholly voluntary and registration is completed in terms of the National um, the Non-Profit Organization Act. I'll just be referring to it as the NPO Act moving forward. The Non-Profit Organizations Directorate maintains a register of all organizations registered as non-profit organizations under the NPO Act. Unfortunately, the directorate has, quote, limited capacity to implement the law. There are a set of requirements that apply that have that have to be fulfilled in order for an organization to qualify as a registered NPO, which include, amongst other things, that it must be a trust, company, or other association of persons established for a public person, and that it may not be an organ of state. Section 239 of the Constitution defines an organ of state as any department of state or administration in the national, provincial, or local sphere of government, or any functionary or institution exercising a power or performing a function in terms of the Constitution or a provincial constitution, or exercising a public power or performing a public function in terms of any legislation but does not include a court or judicial officer. The third tier of the legislative framework allows for NPOs to apply for partial tax exemption. The most common way NPOs do this is by applying to be recognized as public benefit organizations, as I'll be referring to these as just PBOs or just PBO moving forward. The NPOs falling into this tier must also comply with a set of requirements. For example, they cannot distribute profits and must meet certain governance criteria. To quote from non-profit law in South Africa, PBOs may not use their resources to directly or indirectly support, advance, or oppose any political party, but are not restricted from lobbying. They are entitled to a broad range of fiscal benefits, including a partial income tax exemption, an exemption on donation tax, and for some, an exemption on transfer duty on immovable property. The fourth and final tier of the legislative framework facilitates donor deductibility status. What this basically means is that this tier permits public benefit organizations that are eligible to apply for the right to receive taxes as deductible donations. Throughout the 1990s and for much of the 21st century, our legislature has gone about enacting pieces of legislation to regulate charities. I've already mentioned a few of these, namely the Companies Act, the Trust Property Control Act, the Non-Profit Organizations Act, and the... What was the other one I mentioned? I have forgotten but um in addition to these we also have the income tax act the value added tax act the financial intelligence center act and the financial intelligence center amendment act um charities are also regulated by the common law 
Just as a reminder, common law is the unwritten law in a particular state. South African common law is derived from Roman Dutch law, and it has some English law influences. Legislation, also known as acts or statute, is the unwritten law which has been formally enacted by a legislative body. These are elected officials such as parliament or a specific entity which has been given the authority to enact the piece of legislation by a piece of national legislation or a legislative body such as a minister. And then our constitution, which is the most important thing in most cases, so it's supposed to be the most important thing, um, is the supreme law of the state. Every law must be in line with it in order to remain in force. So even this area of the law must always be in line with the constitution. So while this myriad of law exists to regulate the operation, creation, and dissolution of NPOs, there are no statutory provisions in place that allow, that allow the government to ban an association at present. During apartheid, there were a bunch of acts that banned associations for reasons which should be quite obvious. <laughs> These included, amongst many, 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 many others, the Unlawful Organizations Act, the Suppression of Communism Act, and the International Internal Security Act. Many of these acts were completely repealed, which means that they were completely stripped away from the legislative framework and have absolutely no legal force now, whilst others were amended, which is just edited, you know, delete this, add that, and then, or, like, read in a different meaning to what is already there. For example, the Internal Security Act was amended by the Abolition of Restriction on Free Political Activity Act. The Abolition of Restriction on Free Political Activity Act still sets out the offenses of terrorism and sabotage um, as restricted uh, offenses, basically. So it does tacitly ban certain kinds of association, but the Act no longer explicitly provides for the banning of particular associations. The NBO Amendment Bill of 2018, which has not come into force yet, but it was um, published in the Government Gazette on the 10th of May 2022, will add a new paragraph amongst it's emanating a lot of different things but the one that is of relevance here is that it's going to add a new paragraph which is sub paragraph f to section 2 of the npo act sub paragraph f will provide that the objects of the npo act are to encourage and support non-profit organizations in their contribution to meeting the diverse needs of the population of the public by facilitating voluntary registration of non-profit organizations and compulsory registration for foreign organizations operating within the borders of the Republic of South Africa. In the event that an organization was to act beyond the scope of its objectives, an interested party could bring a high court application. In principle, it may be possible for intended beneficiaries of non-profit organizations to seek action against an NPO if they are acting contrary to the founding documents. No example of a successful action of this nature could, ha- could be found, however. Directors of Section 21 company have certain fiduciary duties in terms of the Companies Act. This entails that they must exercise their powers in the best interest of the company and may not place themselves in a position in which their personal um, interests conflict with those of the company. If a director fails to ex- exercise the degree of care and skill which may be reasonably expected of a person of his or her experience, he or she may be liable to the company for any loss it may result in itself as a result. So I'm using he or she because that's what, it, that's what in the act. But, you know, he, she, and they. And South Africa does not have a history of members of governing bodies of NPOs being held liable for breach of their fiduciary duties. There have been a number of initiatives to develop codes of ethics to improve the governance in the non-profit sector. None of the codes have been widely adopted and applied in the sector, and this has impacted on the usefulness. There are currently no private sector organizations that help monitor charitable organizations in South Africa. The non-profit organizations that are created has very limited power to enforce the provisions of the NPO Act. Where an organization fails to report as provided for in the Act, the director may give notice to the organization and give the organization one month within which to comply with the Act. If the organization still fails to submit the necessary reports or submit or submits false information, the director can cancel the registration of the organization. There is no specific mechanism for holding governing bodies liable for misuse or misappropriation of funds. Fraud and misappropriation of funds are governed by ordinary principles of criminal law. 
There are no specific restrictions on South African organizations receiving foreign grants. No government consent is required in order for organizations to receive government grants. The Disclosure of Foreign Funding Act 26 of 1989, which was operation during the apartheid era, was repealed in its entirety in section um, in 1939. 1993. This will be relevant when we speak later on in this very episode. There are also no restrictions on the political activities on organizations unless they are says as public benefit organization the income tax act restricts pbos from using its resources to directly or indirectly support advance or oppose a political party however there are no clear lobbying limitations for any organization whether or not it's a pbo again relevant <laughs> although there have been instances in south africa where the funds of non-profit organizations have been misappropriated there's not general per- perception that non-profits are used to taxes that ought to be paid on business or commercial profits furthermore there's no general perception that non-profit organizations have been used by politicians or government officials to benefit themselves politically or financially again <laughs> it's going to be of extreme relevance um later on in this very episode in Charity and Shame Towards Reciprocity, Cameron Parcel and Andrew Clark talk about the shame recipients of charity feel and how this is linked with the lack of reciprocity in the charity exchanged. What this reciprocity basically entails is that both parties feel that, like they are giving and receiving something from each other. They argue that this reciprocity is oftentimes lacking in the modern day charity model. The article focuses on the um, Australian context where there are a few arguments here that may not be relevant in our context and there are other considerations that are relevant in South Africa which are not considered in the article. For instance, the racial, spatial and colonial dynamic, dynamics at play when one thinks of charity in South Africa are not considered in this article because they aren't really that prominent in Australia, I assume. Right? So, Puzzle and uh, Clark said, quote, The experiences of shame were driven by a threat to people's sense of self as capable. Accessing charity contrasted with their life histories characterized by looking after themselves. Whereas people describe past life experiences of employment as contributing to their sense of normality and pride, charity put pressure on their positive self-perception that had been formed for participation in the labor market. They also say that reciprocity cannot occur without recognition of people and their status as equal. When people are seen as the same and charity is not viewed as an act of compassion for the drawn trodden, a vision for reciprocity can be pursued. But what about people who have never experienced employment? What about people who have never experienced the associated normality and pride that comes with selling your labor in the labor market, of knowing nothing other than being the recipient of aid? Most I said, quote, accepting a gift without reciprocating is to face subordination, to become a client and a servant. Parcel and Clark say further that the Australian government positions welfare and the social services as pathways to independence, self-sufficiency, and a way to overcome welfare dependency. Personally, I don't think that welfare and social services are positioned the same way in South Africa. Let's look at the provisions of housing in our country and let's contrast that with the land bank movement, which has stalled, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'll be talking about land and housing at greater length in one of my future episodes because I have many thoughts. So... The state makes provision for housing through the RDP housing program, uh, the more inadequate, inept cousin of former attempts at fixing issues in the country. Tawambeki, middle finger to you. But in any case, in order to qualify for an RDP house, one must be a South African citizen, over 21 years old and be mentally sound to sign a contract, a first-time government subsidy recipient and homeowner, married or living with a partner or single and having dependents children don't necessarily have to be your own military veteran and the elderly also qualify earning less than 3.5 thousand rand a month per household this means that if it is a two person household and the combined income is more than 3500 rand you won't qualify South Africans with disabilities are supposed to get preference when it comes to allocation of subsidized housing housing and the house must be built so that it is accessible People who successfully obtain an RDP house are not renting it from the state. They are, in fact, the owners of that particular house. In order to be a house of an immovable property, a house is even immovable property, you have to obtain a title deed. The process of obtaining a title deed is usually very long for RDP beneficiaries because of bureaucracy and a bunch of other 
factors so it, um um rdp beneficiaries are seldom immediately the full owners of their houses rdps tend to be built in townships and other predominantly black settlements which are by design completely separated from the economic hubs of this country on the other hand we have land land reform has been for lack of a better word an absolute shit show since colonization the idea of redistributing land has been met with consistent resistance from the on land owning white people and feed dragging from the lead black politicians who have been promising to return land to poor black south africans since the end of apartheid over the years action regarding land back movement has slowed down and has in my opinion reached a very dissatisfying standstill what is really sad about this is that owning land gives people a great deal of power and the lack of it makes so that one remains in a state of perpetual powerlessness so as i was thinking my things i ended up asking myself why the state has provided housing although this is not sufficient but has largely has been largely ineffective in redistributing land my theory is that in prioritizing one over the other the state gets to manufacture dependence on it whilst making sure that power remains in the hands of a select few the fact that rdps are being built in guamashu but not in midrand is very telling it's why i have been screaming from the mountains for since i started to have proper brain action that nothing has fundamentally changed in this country but obviously we need welfare and social services in south africa people need to have fair shelter people need the dignity of being able to point to a piece of property and say hey that's mine nobody can take that away from me the right to housing and the right to human dignity are constitutional rights the latter is an absolute right which means it cannot be limited whatsoever and yet the provision of housing which is usually insufficient sometimes usually <laughs> poorly built reinforces the spatial spatial separation and um the exclusion of black people from economic activity has been prioritized over the provision of land with all its associated privileges i am not saying that land ownership is the end all be all but ask yourself why there has been so much dissent at the mere mention of black people owning land but not nearly as much when they are regulated to inadequate housing to quote from the parcel and clock article the mechanisms that create conditions for people to seek charity are policy driven not economic parcel and clock go on to say that quote scholars argue that interacting forces associated with neoliberalism explain the bourgeoisie uh, role of charity including growing inequalities the shrinking role of the state as a welfare provider and legislative change to increase capacity of faith based organizations as social services provider These changes constitute a movement away from state responsibility to meet the needs of people as a matter of justice. Dees argues that the act of charity whereby a person suffering is given a resource is deemed more praiseworthy than enacting social change to prevent social problems in the first place. Researchers challenge charity because it makes the wealthy feel good about both themselves and the existence of poverty. Just this year in April, Kwazulu-Natal was swept with absolutely devastating floods. The floods caused the death of over 430 people, displaced over 40,000 people, and completely destroyed over 12,000 houses in the northeast part of South Africa. It also severely damaged infrastructure such as roads, healthcare centers, and schools. The damage caused to the infrastructure amounted to at least 10 billion rand, which is uh, 656 million dollars. It was one of the deadliest disasters in the country in the 21st century and the deadliest storm since the 1987 floods which took the lives of over 500 people. The damages caused were so catastrophic that Dr. Mapa Katau declared a provincial state of disaster on the 14th of April. In answering whether the South African government's response to disaster disasters is adequate, timely and enough to assist affected communities, Dr. Olivia Gunguma, a lecturer in the Disaster Management Training and Education Center for Africa at UFS said that the response is fair. To quote her opinion piece, the fact that there is a good disaster legislation that guides the process makes it a positive starting point. The challenge where timeline timeliness is affected is the lengthy process of declaring the disaster so the response can take place quickly. The response to the KZN flooding was also slow and inadequate, leading to significant impacts. The government's inadequacy in slowness and slowness in springing to action is highlighted by the fact that immediately after the floods we saw different charities such as the Gift of the Givers organizing to provide relief to the victims. Petrus Motsepe, a South African billionaire, billionaire, <laughs> South African billionaire, also pledged to donate money during this time. In the first few days after the floods, all we could see were volunteers from Gift of the Givers and small religious charities from KZN helping the victims. Government officials were nowhere in sight. In the weeks and months after, 
various government authorities have authorized have announced that they are repairing for infrastructure and aiding affected individuals. For instance, on the 6th of May, Relief Web reported that Figilem Balula said government was working closely with the communities to ensure speedy repairs to both the road and rail infrastructure in the shortest possible time is realized. He also reported that the infrastructure will be repaired in various phases. Even though this is good news, what um, what the handling of the disaster tells me is that due to our government's insistence on dragging its feet, there are gaps in social services which charities are beginning to fill up which is very problematic. <laughs> it is only where they do not have enough capital to provide aid, where South Africans must just wait for an issue to be solved, which is incredibly problematic and begs the following questions. What will happen if the charities acquire enough capital to fulfill all the government's functions? Or an even better question, what will happen when charities get to decide what happens in government? Earlier on in this episode, I quoted that PBOs may not use their resources to directly or indirectly support, advance, or oppose any political party, but are not restricted from lobbying. I said that there are no clear restrictions to lobbyists amongst any of the NPO forms. But what is lobbying? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says lobbying is uh, to conduct activities aimed at influencing public officials and especially members of a legislative body on legislation. The short story long is that it's basically when a company gets to tell the legislator, hey, make this law, or hey, remove this from the legislative framework. So there are three main forms of lobbying, namely direct lobbying, grassroots lobbying, and electoral lobbying. To quote from Study Smarter, (laughs) this is dumb, it's like saying to quote from freaking, what are the sites where people get notes i don't i forgot them but direct lobbying is when a lobbyist approaches a person in power about a specific piece of legislation while expressing their specific views on it this can happen both in person in a face-to-face meeting or indirectly by phone or email grassroots lobbying is when the lobbyist approaches the public in an attempt to get them to put pressure on the government about an issue that favors the lobbyist electoral lobbying is when a lobby group provides funds or resources for a candidate's electoral campaign <laughs> so it's basically nice clean sanitized word for corruption <laughs> when you look at the form of lobbying and what pbos are prevented from doing you would think you are being presented with a blatant contradiction and that's because you are if a pbo may not use their resources to directly or indirectly support advance or oppose any political party then why would they be permitted to lobby which necessitates all of these things when i googled if there are any charities that fund our any of our political parties i was met with a the citizen article i clicked on it and found out information that made me go hey 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 <laughs> literally that was my reaction but yeah out of all the political parties in south africa only four disclose where they got their donations from namely the democratic alliance which received 15 million nine hundred and seventy seven thousand six hundred eighty seven rand and 13 cents the african national con con congress which received 10,000 rand 10 million did i say 10,000 no i didn't say i said too many words for the for me to be just 10,000 action essay which received 750,000 and patriotic alliance which received 310,000 most of their donations were from corporations or billionaires and though i would like to get into that that would be also the scope of this episode what I would like to get into is one of the DA's donors and one of the ANC's donors. Let's start with the ANC. To quote, the den- donor was an entity known as Boto Boto Commercial Enterprise LTD. The private company was established in 1999 in Menlo Park, Pretoria, and its sole product director is South African mining billionaire businessman Petrus Mutsip, <laughs> the brother-in-law of President Cyril Ramaphosa. It was unclear what kind of business Boto Boto uh, commercial enterprises involved in the IEC said the IEC is the Independent Electoral Commission said this entity should not be confused with Bato Bato Trust, which has investments in petroleum giant shells exploration business. <laughs> Bato Bato Trust donated fifty million rand to the NC between October and December twenty twenty one. I found this one interesting because it is unclear what the business actually does, which is very like you know dubious is that what dubia dubious i was gonna say dubious as if that's a word unless if it is dubious right and also i remember when i said earlier on that that one of the issues that like it is unclear what the directors of npos what their political and personal reasons for donations are and this is where it's like most prevalent why are you making these donations we can guess why 
right the answer can be extrapolated but we are going to end this discussion off with saying why are you doing that not by answering <laughs> next up is the da one of its donors is the Frederick Noman Foundation. The Frederick Noman Foundation is a non-profit foundation that promotes civic education that is rooted in liberalism. It is a non-profit organization. <laughs> it says in its mission statement that it is its um Political consultation focuses on solving political, economic, and social problems. They say they support liberal partners abroad in a variety of ways, for example, by strengthening organized liberalism and developing and building constitutional structures, which is legal speak for we love to interfere with the internal politics of other sovereign states. This is where the whole fact that, like, we have literally contradictory provisions with, like, they could just argue that we are lobbying, right? We are we are doing this electoral lobbying, whereas literally it is to use your resources to, direct, to directly. Here with the DA, they keep mentioning that they're supporting the DA. So it's to directly support and advance a political party. But then you could just say, I'm lobbying. I'm just doing an electoral lobbying because they provide funds for their electoral campaign campaigns but it's like you see that when you just use like semantics to avoid <laughs> the foot of the law i guess but hey very fascinating stuff here yeah. The overview of Rob Reich's Just Giving says, Though we may lord wealthy individuals who give away their money for society's benefits, John's, um, Just Giving shows how much gener such generosity not only isn't the unassailable good we think it to be, but might also undermine democratic values and set back aspirations of justice. Big philanthropy is often an exercise of power, the conversion of private assets into public influence, and it is a form of power that is largely unaccountable, often perpetual and lavishly tax advantaged. The affluent and the foundations reap vast benefits even as they influence policy without uncountability. And small philanthropy or ordinary charitable giving can be problematic as well. Charity, it turns out, does surprisingly little to provide for those in need and sometimes worsens inequality. These outcomes are shaped by the policies that define and structure philanthropy. When, how, uh, much, and to whom people give is influenced by laws governing everything from the creation of foundations and non-profits to generous, generous tax exemptions for donations of money and property. I didn't buy the book because I would have to pay for that. and But like from the latter part of the overview, I'm not sure if I would have agreed with everything that the book says, but what I do agree with is the portion which I've quoted. I also agree with Clement Ettel, a British Prime Minister. I don't know anything he's done, so if he's done something bad, please... I'm not supporting that. I'm just saying the quote. In his quote, he says that the evil of charity is that it tends to make the charitable think that he has done his duty by giving away some trifling sum. His conscience is put to sleep and he takes no trouble to consider the social problem any further. A foundation that is emblematic of this evil of charity is the Rockefeller Foundation. It was founded by the ultra-rich and ultra-evil oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller, who created Stanford Oil and ruthlessly destroyed his competition so as to create a monopoly of the oil industry. The irony in this is that he had created a foundation whose aim was to, quote, promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world, whilst also doing his best to resist labor unions. <laughs> in response to Rockefeller's fabulous philanthropy, former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt um, said no amount of charities in spending such uh, such fortunate <laughs> no amount of charities in spending such fortunes can compensate in any way for the misconduct in acquiring them. Rockefeller's philanthropic advisor was a man by the name of Frederick Taylor Gates, who should not be infused with Bill Gates. Bill Gates can be thought of as the twenty first century's John D. Rockefeller. However, if Bill Gates is Jacob Zuma, then John D. Rockefeller is Nelson Mandela, which means that public perception of them tend to be quite different and their net negative is um different <laughs> so do with that information what you will but after allegedly stealing the software that makes microsoft microsoft from gary kildall the guy who actually invented it and then proceeded to cooperate it so that no one could recreate the the software that is what what <laughs> i did not write the sentence properly what i'm saying is after allegedly stealing the software that makes Microsoft Microsoft from Gary Kildall, Bill Gates proceeded to copyright it so that no one could recreate the software, which is why I was trying to make a link that he's like Rockefeller because he did like the monopoly thing 
but I did not follow the rules of sentences, so the impact is gone. So, apologies. Much like Rockefeller, Bill Gates has a charity, namely the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation is the second largest contributor to the World Health Organization, second only to the United States. The the Gates Foundation accounts for some 10% of the WHO's budget. Lawrence Gostin, faculty director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University in the U.S. said, Without its resources, many global health goals would not be placed at risk, such as polio eradication would be placed at risk, not not, would be placed at risk, such as polio eradication, and that most of the funding Gates provides to the WHO is tied to specific agendas of the foundation. That means that the WHO cannot itself set global health priorities and is beholden to a largely unaccountable private sector. Unlike states, the Gates Foundation has a little democratic accountability. To quote from Swiss Info, that's a concern it's been documented. That's a concern that's been documented. I can't read. <laughs> that's a concern that's been documented, says Lindsay McGoy, a professor of sociology at Essex University in the UK, who wrote a book, No Such Thing as a Free Gift, The Gates Foundation and the Price of Philanthropy, on Gates and Global Public Health. She thinks Gates has an ideological interest in seeing measurable results on a quick timescale to show that billionaire philanthropy is working. I think it's because he has a personal interest in seeing results quick because it helps to bolster his own reputation, says McGoy. The same article went on to say that some public health officials have disagreed with Gates' priorities, but there is reluctance to criticize him for fear of losing support. For example, the WHO and its members had no power to promote the wavering of the COVID vaccine's patent at the time the article from Swiss Info was written as the Bill Gates um, the, as Bill Gates was staunchly against it. The issue that makes it so that the WHO is financially dependent on the Gates Foundation, namely because, quote, states' mandatory um, assessments haven't risen materially in years, and these assessments are wholly in consummate with the WHO's global mandate, is the same reason why the Gates Foundation and other similar charities get to exercise unfettered control over global matters. Going back to the Parcel and Clark article, the authors argue that the emphasis on the giver rather than the receiver offers insight into why today's model of charity is similar to that of the 19th century, when charity was a primary means of addressing poverty. I do not think that this is true in the South African context. In South Africa and the entire global South, technically, charity is the primary means of acquiring power. In my opinion, the fact that Bill Gates keeps telling Africa to buy gene-edited seeds or other new types of crop innovation to end hunger, and the fact that he likes to invest in genetically modified seeds and chemical companies, and the fact that the Bill Gates Foundation donated $7 billion to the various African countries to, quote, support breakthrough solutions in health, agriculture, and gender equality, and other critical areas, are inextricably linked. There's also probably a link between these occurrences and the fact that Billy Boy is busy buying up all the farmland in America. But no, he just wants to hang end hunger in Africa, right? There's, there's no other reason. I love it when profit motives and human rights collaborate. <laughs> but anyways, the charity model, as the dominant model in Australia and elsewhere, is predicated on a misrecognition of recipients. Through funding requirements and public sentiment, people using charity are positioned as the vulnerable. Their poverty is assumed to be driven by individual failure, and this status represents a totalizing identity of vulnerability. Charity is a means to pro- provide resources to the inadequate on the one hand, and the opportunity for the charitable to exercise their compassion on the other. It, autonomy in service provision is not peculiar to charity providers, as Lipsky's pioneering work illustrates. Welfare professionals or street-level bureaucrats also exercise discretion on how they dispose resources and services. However, the unstructured and unregulated nature of charity work means that the volunteers experience greater autonomy than welfare professionals. Without legislative requirements that govern professional practice or entitlement to resources, the literature shows that services and resources provided by charities are inconsistent. Despite the charity formally endorsing an approach to engaging with people, accessing the services, that emphasizes human dignity and um, humanity and dignity so that people feel more of a person after leaving than they did when they arrived we observe not only the great diversity in practice but also disagreement over what constitutes the most appropriate way to engage recipients volunteers work under conditions of autonomy from this autonomous position rather than a professional standard or a strict norm shaped 
That shaped how people operated, the diversity in practices and views reflected the meaning volunteers ascribed to helping others. In this way, what the, what the authors basically mean by that is that the fact that they are not regulated by a specific piece of legislation or a specific code of conduct means that they end up being able to pick and choose, let's say, who's deserving of aid. So someone comes to you and says they're hungry and you look at them and then maybe they're fat and you're like, oh my goodness, you're overweight. There's no way that you're actually hungry. Then you refuse to give them food, even though there may be other factors that contribute to, to maybe them gaining weight and this arbitrary ability to decide how and who is deserving of aid ends up being problematic in the long run and even in the short term the very first time i saw a person with crush yoko was because of the song we are the world not the version from the 1980s but the one that features little wayne and the other artist i was eight at the time and my sister was watching mtv or something i remember feeling a mixture of fear and pity why does that person have a stomach like that I remember going to my mom and asking about the song. I'd hum the chorus to her. My mom obviously didn't know about Lil Wayne or his version of We Are The World, so she told me about the Lil Nell Richie version. She said it had something to do with fundraising for the hungry people in Ethiopia. I guess it's important to disclose that I did not understand that there was a world beyond my township, my grandmother's home, and my town. My world began and ended in my corner of South Africa, and the fictional world in the TV where people spoke in a foreign language that seemed to come out of their noses. The first time I heard of India was in a pamphlet about human trafficking. The first time I heard about hungry African children was on a charity ad on TBN, and I only remember it because of the grotesque imagery it featured. I felt embarrassed when I saw that ad. Is this where the Africa part of South Africa comes from? How could this be true? I'd seen poor people at this point in my life, but they had never looked like that. I was so confused. A few months ago, my mom had let the TV on a Christian TV channel. I can't remember the name of it for the life of me because it's kind of a new, not new, but it's not like the one I grew up on. I had never watched this particular channel because the way the preachers interpret the Bible stresses me out. And it is an ex- excellent, excellent window into the American religious right, which also stresses me out. However, that day the TV was on that channel. The first thing I saw was an ad for a charity. There were a bunch of kids from Africa with bloated tummies and visible rib cages and flies flying around their faces. This time when I saw the ad, I was furious. There was no pity, there was no confusion, there was nothing but pure rage. Did they ask for the parents' consent? Why couldn't they wipe their faces? Why that angle? Why that coloring? Why were film- filming them squatting in that way? How will my $20 donation, love donation specifically, that will buy Bibles for these people, do literally anything to improve their lives. I was a 20 year old, not 8, and yet the advertisements had not changed. I understand, although not fully, what Africa is and what it isn't. I understand which factors um, bolster the perpetual poverty of the people in the ad. I understand that the racist implications of posting Africa in this way are beneficial for them. Of saying, look at how these people are living. Thank God it isn't you. Now give us your money so that you can feel better about throwing away your food and so that we can maintain the status quo. For this portion of every episode, I did not do research. I wanted to, but it's so hard (laughs) to actually find information to kind of um, bolster my perspective on the internet because like there's an insistence on viewing charities and the way they advertise and the way they um, commodify African suffering for their own motives that is like celebrated instead of discouraged right so i'm just going to speak from the heart and from my own experience so in terms of my religious background i'm very christian i'm you know when you say very christian that has a lot of implications that i don't agree with like i'm a christian who is has common sense right so but i am religious and i've watched religious shows my own life i for the first few years of my life, I wasn't even allowed to listen to secular music. I only started listening to like anything other than Christian music when I was like fourteen. And the worst part is like my parents weren't like strict. They weren't like st- um whatever the word is like. They weren't. They didn't have an iron fist. They just were like listen to this, don't listen to that, and I just listened, and it was perfectly fine with me. Right? It was a very cool cool time technically, and then that's the kind of perspective that I'm coming from. Um, I, there's so many personal things I want that I could mention to kind of prove my point, but I don't really want to. There's only so much you should share on the internet. But I want to talk about the first time I, outside of the ads and stuff, when I'd see the hungry African children. Throughout my 
life watching so much tv like as a kid even now i consume so much american tv um it's amazing that i don't have an american accent i think it's because in life i still spoke stoana spoke or whatever you want to call it the only became to be doing like two years ago that's stoana before that but um i remember there'd be different shows where kids would throw away their food and they'd be like oh my goodness what about the having african children don't you feel guilty and i'd be like what what is that now and then at first when i first heard about this i was like but that's not true i'm not suffering so clearly no one else is suffering this is a lie and then as time went on i'd see maybe pictures of uh, futuristic african cities with like big buildings and yeah you see you're saying we are uncivilized or we are hungry or whatever and yet we manage to do these great things how could you say that and then over time i kind of realized that the existence of maybe hungry people in the continent is not is not a fault of theirs as people as individuals and the problem is the way that it is positioned in the media the problem is the governments who don't do what they're supposed to do the government is the unequal north south relations that make so that africa is in a state of poverty even though we have some of the most rich like we're the most resource rich countries in the world so it's like it would kind of link as well with like maybe they didn't pray hard enough maybe when when they asked they were not doing it in the proper format maybe that's why it's not working out for them and i over time have kind of shifted my perspective but i will say that my idea of why people were struggling was very much formed by what i'd seen on tv and what i read in books about hard work and how hard work is what will get you out of your poverty and you know over time you realize that that's not really true and i remember that one thing now back to the my respect on one thing i have to contend with at a point in my life is the fact that this religion that i believe in and i don't like want to let go of is was so important was such a huge driving force in the colonial um conquest you know like in the process of just whether it's literally economic colonization but also cultural colonization right because the fact that we have managed to adapt so many of these markers of western civilization as a country has just separated us more and more from um more indigenous practices again i don't want to talk about that too much because like it's just so many things but it you know so my issue again is that there are very few if any laws in africa that regulate how npos uh, interact with their own citizens so the fact that maybe there isn't a law that says hey xyz charity cannot take pictures of kids in such a condition it should be illegal right is the consent from parents obtained right like all of the stuff do they get any sort of money from them being included in the advertisement right i recently we enacted the protection of private information act i don't know if it actually covers this kind of stuff but it should because um it's you have to be given consent to take pictures of you for specific but i think it's i don't let me not speak about that i have not read but it's there and i'm hopeful that it will be a good contributing factor and it will be also good contributing factor like similar piece of legislation i hope they'll be enacted in other countries as well and so yeah like i also think a lot about the element of like charitable giving for religious purposes because you want to you want to be blessed you want to be saved and whether or not like we can expect people to be fully selfless to be giving for anything other than to want something in return you know that goes back to the whole idea of that reciprocity thing i know that yeah i know i'm just rambling i don't even know what i'm saying but it's the end of the episode so hopefully that was coherent enough to follow <laughs> yeah Oh, in my new this new era of the screw you thing, I wanna come up with a few solutions. If there's like an episode type that can be given for solutions, so solutions to things with charities and how they operate and the stronghold they have, like 
there's not much that we can do as individuals but you can try your best by like disengaging from the charity industrial or con- industrial complex so the first thing you can do is to start or join a mutual aid organization near where you live so mutual aid is just basically you go to the people around you you ask what do we need and then you find ways of accomplishing that goal so if around where you live maybe there is a deficit in kids reading then you avail yourself you find other people as well to avail themselves to read for the kids right something like that if you live in a poor neighborhood or something like that then you can start a a, where you know that there are a lot of people who do not have food then you start a community garden the problem with this is that it's very hard i am speaking from experience about how hard it is to do mutual aid especially if you're like me and you're like your university is far away from home so you can't you you live in a university city for like most of the year but you don't really relate to the people around you and the people around you don't really need aid like i'm surrounded by people with two like lots of money i don't think they need anything from me and if they like you know whereas where you're actually from there you have connections there you have an understanding of what can and should be done because you're from there so it can make it a bit difficult but i mean if you can find a way you know just do it so the next thing i'd recommend is like if you cannot find a mutual aid organization or it's too hard to start one or anything like that then focus on joining small local charities so don't join charity corporations multinational corporations charity edition join something that is specific to where you live uh people who understand the area and who like just join just join, join a smaller charity you can you can use your own discretion to see if they're doing what they're saying they want to do or not but just focus on something that's more connected like a more grassrootsy type beat and then my last recommendation is uh become a lobbyist and tell the government which laws to enact <laughs> anyways guys we reached the end of today's episode i hope you enjoyed it I did a lot of research, <laughs> so much research. It may not really transfer, but I read so many things for this thing, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so I hope you are all gonna be excited for my next episode. I don't know yet what I'm gonna do, but I know it's gonna be great. Uh, yes. So thank you again for listening. I hope you have a fabulous day, and make sure that you do something good. Yes. Bye bye.